Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's V Brown Bag. We're extremely excited to be continuing our home lab series. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at a VMware 6.5 home lab uh, with all the trimmings, VROPs and vSAN and everything. Uh, helping us present that is Steve Tilkins. Before I hand it over to Steve, I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, different shows, the different ways to get in touch with me. Uh, and I'm your host, Tom Green. I'll be monitoring Twitter. If you do hashtag vbrownbag. I'll be sure to get your questions and comments read on the air. I'm also going to be monitoring the at vbrownbag and all the other handles there as well. Uh, this show is our U.S. show, but it's not our only show. We have uh, many different shows throughout the uh, the week in different time zones. So if there's a show in a time zone that uh, makes more sense for you, please feel free to join us. All the information about um, our shows and our upcoming guests can be found at vbrownbag.com slash brownbags. And with that, I'm going to let Steve introduce himself, and I'll hand him presenter. So how are you doing, Steve? Good, good. Thanks, Tom. Um, loving the weather tonight. It's like 70 degrees today it's in California here. <laughs> it's currently 27 in Kentucky, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't mean to rub it in. Uh, <laughs> All right, can you see my screen? Uh, yep, I see it. Looks good. All right, cool. So uh, thanks for the intro, Tom. Uh, let me introduce myself real quick. So my name is Steve Tilkins. I am a technical account manager with VMware, and I'm based out of the Sacramento, California area. So uh, prior to VMware, I worked for a large healthcare organization, and I was more of a uh, systems engineer, kind of architecture, very hands-on, you know, deploying systems, things like that. So. I've been uh, working with VMware technology for, gosh, at least the last 12 years or so. So we go way back. Um, so what I was thinking tonight was I would uh, go through a real quick PowerPoint presentation. I don't like doing too much PowerPoint. I like to get hands-on. So um, I think maybe 10, 15 minutes tops PowerPoint. Uh, we'll go through kind of some of the things I want to talk about, and then we'll just jump right into the lab and uh, just get our hands dirty. Uh, at that point, once we do the hands-on demo, it's completely unscripted, so I figured we'd just we'd hop around from one to one thing to the next and just kind of play around. So what you're saying good is to you guys? tonight we're getting a live demo? Yeah, I know. Awesome. Let's make knock, sure knock on uh, it, right? everybody on Twitter go ahead and do your uh, live demo sacrifices so that everything goes smooth. <laughs> We just jinxed it, I think, Tom. All right. Uh, so real quick, an agenda. I just want to talk about kind of why did I build a home lab? What was the intent, right? Uh, what were there some of the requirements? We'll go through the bomb so you can see kind of what I bought and you know, how much it cost, ultimately. Um, I did deploy my lab in two separate phases. So I just wanted to kind of do a quick comparison of phase one versus phase two from a cost perspective versus what were the resources that that I got from each phase? Um, I have a couple pictures, uh, just so you can kind of get your get a feel for what I have and what it looks like. And then after that, we'll just jump into the the demo. And we'll just start playing around. So, so real quick, let's go through. You know, what was the intent? Why why did I build this one? Right. So for for years, I I always wanted to, to build an actual home lab and have some real power, but um, I was always just kind of running things on top of my laptop, right? VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation, which works really well, but when you get to the scale of what you want to build, you know, four VMs or above, it, it uh, you kind of run out of resources fast, right? CPU and especially memory, so. So I always struggled with that, so, so really the first the first reason why I did it was just for customer value. So as a technical account manager, I've got a lot of local customers here. And it, I find it very valuable when I can come into a customer and say, look, um, let me show you this particular product or how to configure this one particular thing in my lab. I've done it. Right? We can actually play with it. We can break it. We can blow it up, whatever. Um, 
It also helps when uh, a customer comes to me and says, hey, how do we do this? How, you know, what's the best practice around this? And I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't know everything. That's, I don't think you can know everything in this industry. So that's where the home lab really comes in. It's like, you know, that's a good question. Let me, let me pull up my lab and we'll do it, right? So, so first and foremost is customer value. And it's, it's proven to be very valuable in that aspect. Um, the second reason is really just learning and enablement, right? So VMware has a lot of products. In fact, when I, when I came on board almost three years ago, I was, I was kind of shocked at how many different products we had. I mean, I was kind of a traditional vSphere guy. And I mean, and there's, there's a lot of stuff that we own. Um, so having the, the home lab and the capacity to spin up these products and play with them has been invaluable just just to get to know the products and, and speak intelligently about it right um, not to mention we we release updates all the time so putting the latest and greatest in there is, is always helpful and then lastly it's fun right I'm a geek so it, it's like a hobby for me I, I don't look at this as work I, I, I find it extremely fun and I, I stay up late a lot of nights just kind of playing around and, and building stuff so uh, so that's really, you know, what I wanted to get out of it. And so far, it's, it's proven to uh, to provide all these things. So what were the air quote business requirements, right? I mean, I kind of came from private industry where I looked at it as a project, right? So let's define our business requirements, which will kind of drive the technical requirements and uh, we'll treat it like a real project, right? So first and foremost, I needed something scalable and flexible, right? Like I mentioned earlier, I, I was always running labs off my laptop and uh, running out of memory and CPU real fast. So I really wanted something that I could kind of uh, upgrade memory specifically or storage. Uh, CPU seems to be doing steady. Uh, I'll show you guys that soon. But that was really the first requirement, just kind of having more, more capacity, right? Uh, speed and performance. That was without a doubt, number one. I mean, if I was going to spend a lot of money, which uh, I'll get into what I spent here soon, but it was, you know, a few thousand dollars. So I wanted it to be fast. So the majority of the stuff I have is all on SSD. It's a, it's an all flash vSAN cluster and it's, it's pretty quick. So that was, that was a big requirement for me was that it was, uh, it was speedy and uh, I didn't have to wait for it. Right. Uh, cost was obviously a big factor, and uh, it was probably a little more than I was expecting to spend at first, but uh, after the first phase and and I saw how much value it was providing, I really had no problem with moving forward with the second phase because it was it was invaluable at that point. So uh, I didn't want to break the bank, obviously, but I think I think what I spent was reasonable. So. And then home friendly, right? I didn't want to have all these you know, pizza box, uh, rack mount servers laying around, making a ton of noise and generating a bunch of heat, killing my power bill, right? So it needed to be fairly clean looking and quiet, especially quiet. And then the, the power bill was, uh, was another factor. So, so those were the main requirements. And uh, I'll show you kind of what I ended up deploying here. So let's move forward with the bomb. So, before I did any of this, I was using just kind of a traditional uh, consumer grade Netgear home router access point, right? Um, so obviously the first thing I needed to buy was a switch. So I went with the Ubiquiti network equipment, which if you haven't looked at Ubiquiti, it's, it's amazing stuff. It's like, in my opinion, enterprise grade and it's super cheap. So, so I started off with a 24 port uh, edge switch light and, and it's super cheap. It's like 185 bucks, right? So. So that was the first purchase I made, and then I bought a bunch of Cat, uh, Cat 6 patch cables to go with it. Uh, the servers I went with for the first phase, I got an amazing deal from a, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Bill. So if Bill, if you're out there, I, I think I owe you one because you gave me <laughs> two very decent servers for an amazing price. So, so what I ended up with was two uh, HP ProLiant microserver Gen 8s. And he upgraded the, the processor. So those are quad cores running at 2.5 gigahertz, which is pretty decent. And it was already maxed out at the 16 gigs that it could handle. Uh, these servers didn't have any local disks. So he was running it with a NAS. I didn't have a NAS. So 
you'll see here coming up, I had to purchase some disks. So, but those are the servers I got uh, for phase one. And let's see. Yeah, so moving on, then I bought, uh, I bought an edge router. Uh, I didn't necessarily need it, but 100 bucks, right? And again, ubiquity, so, so that was a good purchase. And then for the storage for those, for those servers I bought, like I said, I wanted to do all flash. So, so I bought two, no, I'm sorry, I bought four 250 gig uh, SSDs. So I put two in each, and I just did a RAID uh, zero. So I just striped across them. Obviously, no redundancy, but again, I wanted the I wanted the performance and I wanted the capacity. And it's a lab, so if it if it blew up on me, whatever, I, I wasn't too concerned about that. Uh, I bought a couple SSD bezels to convert from two and a half to three point five. Um, and then for the heck of it, I I also threw in a, uh, a ubiquity uh, access point, uh, and then a couple more patch cables. So that was phase one. That was in June. And that was just under $1,400. So pretty reasonable. And that got me definitely more than what my laptop was providing. Um, but I quickly was running out of memory real fast. So, so moving on to phase two, which uh, happened in January, so about a month ago. So here I bought two uh, super micro servers. And I got these from uh, the Wired Zone. So if you guys haven't checked that out, it's wiredzone.com. Those guys are awesome. Uh, I placed the order and they had it built up and they even did a burn in test for like a day and they had it shipped out in like two days or something. So those guys are great. So these things have a single processor, uh, the Xeon D1541 at 2.1 gigahertz. And that is an eight core processor. So that gives me 16 logical procs per, uh, per host. And then they came with 64 gigs of RAM, which I can upgrade to 128, which I'll probably end up doing here in the next couple of months because I'm already starting to push it a little bit. I'm at about 70% memory utilization. So I'm definitely spending more in phase two here, but what the heck. So the intent was I'm going to buy two of these and then set up a direct connect uh, 10 gig crossover link and do a, a two node vSAN cluster. Hold on one sec for me. All right, sorry about that. I'm just getting over a cold, so my throat is kind of dry. Um, so to do the, the crossover connect, I did have to buy uh, a couple Cat7 cables. I probably could have gone, gotten away with uh, Cat6, but for the 10 gig, I wanted to have uh, some a little bit better cables there. So then for storage here, I bought uh, four one terabyte SSDs. Uh, so that's going to be the capacity tier for vSAN. And then uh, if you go down to the bottom, I actually bought two 250 gig M.2 SSDs for the caching tier. So that's going to be for uh, just the read caching, or I'm sorry, the write caching, because it's all flash. Then I bought more hard drive bezels for 2.5 to 3.5 inch. Um, I bought a bunch of uh, two terabyte um, regular uh, magnetic drives, and that's just for more capacity. I put those in the original host from phase one, <clears throat> and then I bought a UPS as well. So I spent, uh, you know, about 5,500 here, so definitely more. So a little bit of a phase comparison from phase one to phase two, definitely getting more CPU, uh, more logical processors, definitely more memory, uh, but the cost was, was definitely increased as well, right? So total on the left here, you can see I've got 48 logical processors, about 160 gigs in memory, 12 terabytes of storage for just about $7,000. So that's where I'm at today. So here's some pictures from phase one. These are my, my HP hosts. Uh, you can see my switch on the bottom there, and then uh, the, the SSDs on top. So from a network connection perspective, here's what it looks like. Pretty straightforward, my edge router, uh, direct to the, to the internet, my edge switch, uh, my access point, 
and then my hosts. So phase two, uh, these are the hosts I bought, the super micros. Uh, they're about the same size as the HPs. They're, they're pretty small and, and they're both, uh, the HPs and the super micros are super quiet. In fact, they're about four feet from me right now. So it, it's a little bit louder than a desktop maybe, but for the most part, you don't hear it at all. Um, here's the, the disks I bought for my vSAN and the Cat7 cables. And then here's where I ended up putting it. So that's actually my desk you're looking at. That's the top of my desk. Uh, it's kind of like a bookshelf on top. <clears throat> so I put it at the top, which it's close to the ceiling, which it may get a little warm in the summer months, but uh, we'll see how it does. I kind of wanted it out of the way, but, but it looks pretty clean. And I don't get any, uh, any concerns from the wife. So everything looks pretty good there. And then that, that is an Apple TV on the right there. Cause I do have a 4K monitor. So I figured, well, why not put a 4K Apple TV in there too? <laughs> so that's it. Um, I figured we just, we just jump right in at this point. Uh, is there any questions out there, Tom, before I hop into the land? Uh, we've got one is, uh, do you justify this as a business expense uh, professionally, so like for tax purposes and or for wife acceptance factor purposes? Definitely, yeah. Um, so I've saved receipts for all this stuff and, and I'm writing it off on taxes, definitely. And it really is. I mean, if, if I didn't, if I wasn't in the line of work I'm in, I, I wouldn't be purchasing this stuff. So I don't feel like I'm cheating or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's a wife acceptance factor is a, a big part of what we, we all ask about is how do you get all that through? Oh, yeah. uh, Ken Thomas well, has a question too. Uh, Two hundred fifty dollars for a Gen Eight with sixteen gig of RAM. Where can you get that? Um, I know I've looked on eBay just to see price comparison. You're talking about the HPs, right? Yeah, he was asking about the HP Gen Eights. Yeah, so that price was amazing. I got it from a friend. Um, so I, I kind of owe him because <laughs> it's a crazy price and then I, I feel like I got a deal there big time. So uh, if you look on eBay, you'll see, uh, they should probably have gone for about a thousand dollars each. So. And is there a reason that you went with newer servers versus looking for say older Dell or HP tower servers? Um, especially in phase two. Um, yeah, not really. I mean, I kind of poked around and what I really didn't want was something loud. I know, I know you can get some, uh, some pretty quiet power servers out there, but, um, I just wanted something that was clean and fresh and I knew it was going to be, you know, you know, in, in good shape basically. So I'm sure I could have found something cheaper though. All right, I think we're uh, right. clear for now. Oh. Thanks. All right. Oh, by the way, um, in my PowerPoint deck here, I have a couple, I did a couple blog posts about this as I was kind of building out. So if you want to check those out, um, we'll have to figure out a way to get the uh, the links out there, Tom. But basically, yeah. you just go to Tilkin, Tilkins.com. Yeah, you know, yeah just uh, email them to me and I'll put them in the show notes and I'll tweet them out too. Okay. And then again, check out the Wired Zone. Those guys are awesome. So if you're looking to buy some new gear, those guys can help you out for sure. I was so actually here's my lab. I was looking for some new gear myself, so I'm on there browsing while I'm monitoring Twitter too. Cool. Yeah. Um, so here's my lab. Right. I've got uh, ESXi 6.5 update one running on all my hosts. So this is the uh, the HTML5 browser for the GUI. Jump into hosting clusters. So you can see here my management cluster. There's really enough shared storage here. So it's it's kind of all running off that local disk. Um, but I've got my, my witness host, 
which is running for the, the vSAN cluster. So it's, uh, it's this guy right here, actually. So that's just a virtual client, right? Uh, let me jump into the Flash client, too. All right. Well, that's loading up. <clears throat> so you can see on the uh, the original cluster, I've got, like I said, the witness host, and then this this VM here is uh, just a Windows uh, Plex server. So that's what I needed those those extra four terabyte magnetic drives for, just additional uh, capacity. And then I got a couple NSX controllers, and then uh, this one's actually really cool. This is the the Dell EMC Unity VSA. <clears throat> so if you're familiar with uh, like a VNX, the new version of that is, is Unity from what I understand. So they have a, a virtual appliance. If we jump in here. So this is why uh, I, I stood this up for, so I could do things like NFS and ISW and VVOLs in particular. And the cool thing about this is uh, it's free, and it comes with a license that supports the EMC storage analytics, which is essentially just a vRealize operations management pack, and it provides some really good visibility into the storage. <clears throat> Let me pull up uh, the VROPS environment here. So at this point in time, I'm just kind of going from one thing to the next if you want to help guide me where to go, but otherwise I'll just keep kind of poking around. Yeah, so on the uh, the storage uh, part that you just showed, is there any restrictions with the capacity that you can um, put in your Unisphere? I believe it's four terabytes, which is pretty good, right? So uh, that was what I recall from the documentation. I'm pretty sure it's four terabytes. Is that running on your phase one? I, you may have said it and I missed it. But like, where does yeah, that Yeah, the actual, sit? the VSA itself is running in the management cluster, which is the HP host. Um, but if you look at the storage, I presented uh, an NFS share, um, two VVOLs, and then the MySCSI stuff too. And put that in a, in a cluster actually. So, this particular VM right here, three, is actually running on a VVOLV data store. And uh, it's pretty quick. I mean, it's all running off of that SATA magnetic drive, so it's not as fast, but you know, I just wanted the, the functionality of VVOLV so I could show it to my customers and things like that. Right? But looking at the vSAN cluster, like I said, this is all flash, so <clears throat> it's really fast. So let me the RDP into one of my domain controllers, and uh, hopefully you can see how quick it jumps in here. So, um, Unisphere is a, uh, a hot topic here. Can it act as a primary storage appliance, or is it a uh, it's kind of a personal only ordeal? No, it it absolutely can. Um, in fact, let me jump into VROPS, and we can see some of the dashboards we can see in there. So like I said, it's just a it's just a management pack here. So once you configure that, you'll get a bunch of dashboards. And if we jump into here, we have EMC, the storage analytics adapter. So obviously I've only got the, the Unity stuff, so <clears throat> none of this other stuff really applies, but you look at like Unity overview. You can see the, the storage processor, uh, any disk pool that I've got, and then any LUNs, right? That's really cool. Uh, this is this is going to show you your, your entire topology, right? So from the vCenter down, here you can see all of your, your VVOLs, your individual VVOLs, right? So, Here's that one VM, test 03. And you can see the individual VVOLs. So there's one for swaps, 
Uh, there's one for like the home config. Uh, and then there should be a VMDK here too. And then it's going to show you kind of some, some analytics around it. So. All right, cool. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really neat deep dive there, the stuff that you can get out of it, especially uh, it, the four terabyte capacity limit's really not awful in a home lab. I mean, most home labs probably have less than that total capacity anyway. Yeah. The other cool thing is it's free, right? So you can spin up two of them and it allows for rep <clears throat> for replication. So you could do that too. Pretty Pretty full featured actually. And then the setup was actually really easy. So if you just come in here and you go to VMware, you register it with um, with your VCSA, and it pushes out all the config for you. It just does everything. So really easy. Yeah, it didn't used to be that easy. I'd looked at it a couple years ago, a year <laughs> ago, and it was not this easy. Yeah. Um, but here you can see the virtual drives that I've presented. So these are the VMDKs. Oh no, these are the vVault. Sorry. If we go to system view and then virtual. These are the VMDKs that I've presented to the VSA itself. So I gave it two SSD uh for, for performance and then a couple two hundred and fifty gig slower, you know, spinning disk. Um let's see. So Let's look a little bit more at the vSAN stuff. So I was shocked at how easy vSAN was to set up <clears throat> and how fast it is really. So really you just come into cluster, configure, and you turn it on, right? Had to do a couple other things because it's a it's a two node cluster, so there's a there's that uh witness host. And you have to set up the traffic a little bit. Let me let me look at the networking real quick. So I've got two VDS switches here. Um Everything's connected to the VDS lab, and then just the two super micro hosts are connected to the vSAN VDS for the vSAN traffic itself, right? Uh, but then I have a port group for vSAN witness. So that's what's connected to this, uh, this virtual ESXi host. But if you look at the vSAN uh, monitor here, you can see right here's the health check. The only warning I have is the hardware compatibility. So these super micro hosts, the controller is not on the HCL, but other than that, everything's fine, right? It's just kind of a warning. But you can see I got you know, all my MTUs set up right, my physical disks look good, uh, all the data is, is healthy. From a capacity perspective, you can see I've got about, uh, I think it's like 3.6 terabytes total. And um, used is about, what is it here? 857. I originally had dedupe and compression turned on, uh, and it worked great. It was using a little bit more CPU than I wanted. Um, it, was, it wasn't bad by any means, but. You know, with just two hosts, I didn't want to kind of push it. I wanted to save as much CPU as I could. And I had plenty of disk, so so I turned it off. <clears throat> um, I don't have any resyncing components. This would you'd see things here if, uh, <clears throat> if you had a disk failure or something like that, and you need to kind of rebuild those components. Um, this part's really cool. So within vSAN, you can click on a particular VM. Let's take a domain controller. And I've got one VMDK here, but you can see on which drives it's actually running, right? So where all the components live. It's in a RAID 1, which means it's got mirrored components. So uh, the VMDK itself is basically mirrored across the host. <clears throat> and it shows you the disk that it's on. So pretty slick. And then it's got the witness component as well. Your VCSA is on the HPs or is it on the super micros? It's on the super micros right now. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, I'm right here. The only things I have on the HPs <clears throat> is the management host, or I'm sorry, the witness host, my Plex server, uh, a couple MSX controllers, and then the VSA because it, I wanted the capacity from those those other disks that I added. Okay, I'm answering questions and I answered one, that one wrong, so sorry, Graham. You can see the physical disk in my new servers. Um, <clears throat> I've got the one disk for cache in tier and then the two for capacity. So one disk group per host. So with, with vSAN 6.6, you can do uh, iSCSI targets. So if you had a need to present some other uh, iSCSI disk to something else. You could do that here, which is pretty cool. I didn't turn it on. Um, but yeah, I was really impressed with the vSAN <clears throat> flexibility and how fast it was. So it's been uh, it's been surprisingly really good. And then if we look at VROPS, there's a couple of really good dashboards for vSAN as well. So jump in here. Uh, let's look here. So we've got vSAN capacity. So this one's good. It'll show <clears throat> basically like how many hosts, how many disk groups, data stores, how many capacity disks, what's your overall capacity, how much you're using, how much is left. And then if I had different compression turn on, it would show you know, those ratios and how much I'm saving, that sort of stuff. Um, this is showing how the data is balanced across those four capacity disks. It's pretty balanced. So have you noticed any uh, performance problems or weirdness using consumer grade flash versus uh, going to with an enterprise flash? I haven't, but again, I'm not I'm not doing much here. Um, at one point, when I was moving all the all the VMs from the HP hosts into the new vSAN cluster. I saw it spike to about 8,000 IOPS, and it was <laughs> it was doing fine. Nowadays, it's at, it's running at maybe 20 IOPS, so it's not doing much. Uh, I'm trying to find some other good VROPS, or sorry. We also have I'm someone uh, asking if you were saying VVOLs in the home lab. That was uh, Joey Ware. Yeah. Ah, uh, Joey. Yes, Joey's a good friend. Um, I do have VVOLs. Um, and you can see, uh, let's see, you look at the, the storage here. Actually, I think it's on one. <clears throat> I do have a just one VM running on the VVOL, just so I can see what it looked like. And then if we go over to the VSA, you can see here the virtual drives, which uh, are the VVOLs, right? So I've got one VM, uh, actually three VMs running on the, the VVOL, but this is the only one that's actually got an OS on it. Here's my actual VVOLs themselves. So you can see test 03, there's the config VVOL, there's the swap memory, and then two data because this one's got a snap. So if we go back to this VM, I can remove that snapshot and that should go away. Yeah, so it's gone. So it's a lot more visibility from the storage side, right? Yeah, that's verging on like enterprise grade visibility into a home lab. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> It's pretty cool. Um, so here you can see kind of performance of the vSAN cluster itself. So um, my average disk latency is <laughs> less than two milliseconds. Um, IOPS <clears throat> pretty low, 439. So it's, it's not working too hard and it's pretty fast. So. So what sort of um, fault protection do you have like 
backups, UPS, things of that nature. Yeah, so um, I did get a UPS. Oh, was my thing? Here you can see it. It'll run for about 15 minutes on battery. So it's not great, but uh, a little bit of protection there. For backups, I'm actually doing uh, a bunch of different stuff. So I have on my Plex media server, the uh, RDP into that. Um, basically, there's just a bunch of disk on this thing. So I've set up an FTP server. And I'm basically just sending all my backups here. And then I run a product called Backburner, or sorry, Backblades. And that's just a cloud backup. So I send all my backups here, and then it goes up to the cloud. So I'm doing, I'm doing my NSF, NSX backups, I'm doing uh, VCSA backup from the, the VAMI interface, which if you haven't seen that, it's pretty slick, the 6.5. Be coming to, you know, port 5480 here. And then you can actually do a backup directly from here. And this will this will do everything, the database, you name it. So I do that maybe once a month just to just to get a kind of a, a backup for it, right? Um what else am I doing? Do you um, happen to know if that, the backup. that backup thing is a scriptable API? You have any idea? It is actually, yeah. You can't schedule it here through the GUI, but through API you can. And I think the next version we're, we're looking at putting kind of a, a scheduler in there too. Um, so I got my Plex backups here. Uh, I'm doing SQL backups because uh, I do have VRA and I have uh, an IaaS. It's kind of all in one on my IaaS server. I've got a SQL database here as well. And then I'm doing Windows image backup. So my two domain controllers and then I have just using the, the integrated Windows server backup, <laughs> which I haven't tested a restore, but I figured it's better than nothing. Yet. So that's what I'm doing to kind of protect the environment. Even though if it were to go away and crash, <clears throat> I'd probably just rebuild it anyway. It's, like, it's kind of fun, right? So, so if you were going to do another upgrade to your lab, what would is your next priority? Um, the only thing I have planned is going to be upping my new host to 128 gigs of memory. Beyond that, I don't know. If, I don't know if I didn't need anything else. Honestly, I mean, I've got let's see, I think 20 some VM, 24. And I don't have a whole lot more I need to deploy in here. I'll probably do Horizon. So that'll be a bunch of VMs, but with the additional memory, I should be fine then. Um, I also have Log Insight running, which if you haven't used this, this is an amazing product. And if you own vCenter, you technically own this, uh, a little bit of it anyways. And you should be leveraging it because it's it's awesome for uh, syslog and things like that. Yeah, I um, actually have some blog entries where I spent weeks trying to figure out who modified a VM and wrote up all the stuff I had to do for that. And here, if you go to interactive analysis and type the word modified, it'll show you immediately. It's <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. especially with 6.5 because the, uh, the logging for ESXi in 6.5 is way more verbose. Mm -hmm. So you'll see things like, this user actually modified a VM and they added the RAM rather than uh, VM has been configured or something like that. Yeah, you had to go to two different logs yeah. to figure out who changed it and what changed. Right. So I don't think I've made any modifications. But <laughs> uh, yeah, Log Insight is awesome. So I've got a bunch of content packs loaded into here. Uh, the Active Directory one's pretty cool. I don't have a very dynamic Active Directory, so we're not going to see much here, but yeah, not much going on. Um, IAS, again, I have uh, VRA, so 
<clears throat> that runs off of IIS, some some parts of it. So, uh, SQL, not much here. Yeah, no errors. Again, I'm not doing much, and this is just looking at the last hour. And are those uh, Active Directory um, management packs available through the marketplace in the top right there? Do you have to go out and download them? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to get any of the this level from Windows, you'll need to install the agent, which is uh, just a login site agent. But once you have that, you can come in here and go to Content Packs and look at the marketplace. Now all these are are free, so you just you know, click them and say install. But there's a bunch of stuff out here. So you, know, you can get hardware level monitoring, you know, from your Cisco ASAs or Nexus, UCS, Hitachi, all sorts of stuff. Um, I will say if you're using Log Insight for vSphere or for vCenter, which is that small entitlement I was telling you about, right? If you have vCenter license, then you have a little bit of log insight. You can't use all these content packs. You can just use like the default VMware ones. So anything from VMware like vSphere or vROPS, things like that. Uh, but it's it's pretty powerful. You, you get a lot of visibility here. I have one customer that's using it specifically for the VRO, mm -hmm. the orchestrator, because they're doing VRA and to, to see where things are going wrong and failing. Um, they can't see it through VRO, but they can see it here because it logs it, right? So. That's actually a really good use of it because when something fails in VRO, it's infuriating at times trying to figure out what happened. Yeah. So they'll see it come in. Um, the VSAN or the VSphere stuff. So yeah, <clears throat> pretty pretty powerful. And something that's neat about it is it actually is it accessible through VR, VR ops to Right, yeah. So if you come in here and you go to home, there's a specific section for log insight. Boom, there it is. And even cooler is if you drill down onto something. So if I go to a specific host, for instance. I'll choose three. And then I expand the more here. <clears throat> you can see I've got all this stuff, but logs is right here. So now I'm just looking at logs for, for this host. Right. That That's great. I didn't realize that. that as someone who's worked a lot with Splunk, this is uh, like super easy mode. It's great. Yeah. Um, what else? What else? I know there's some other cool dashboards I've got here. So. Um, this one, which is, I forget what it's called, Management Pack for Network Devices, I want to say. This one's pretty cool. So I've, I've set up SNMP on my Switch to send data to VROPS. So if I click here, you can see I've got one leaf switch, which is my edge router or my edge switch. It's getting a ton of metrics for it. So it sees all sorts of stuff here. It maps it out. Here's my physical switch. It's connected directly to these hosts, which is VMNIC zero, VMNIC zero. I guess they're all using VMNIC zero. And then those are connected to the virtual distributed switches. So if we browse to that switch <clears throat> in the environment section, uh, where is that? Oh, let's put an NSX here. You see it's coming from SNMP. There's my switch. And if we look at all metrics, there's just a ton of data here. So I can see specific port usage, right? Uh, interfaces. Let's say port one. So this is connected to my router. 
we can see egress traffic, for instance. And here you can see my, my offline or my offsite cloud backup is going at like 1130 <laughs> so it's dynamic thresholding right and it knows that's normal for the system every night at 1130 it's going to do a backup so you're going to see the uh, the, the egress traffic go up but a lot of rich data coming from SNMP so um, um, another question came in about your hosts and uh, guest setup do you use an automation tool for any of your host builds or do you hand build that? Uh, not for the host builds. Um, I haven't played with uh, the host profiles really yet. Um, and I have VRA stood up, <clears throat> but I haven't really configured it yet. So that's a work in progress. But it's built, but it's not really doing anything. So at some point, I want to connect this to like Azure and AWS, um, you know, whatever else cloud I can get and provision workloads out to the cloud too, which would be really cool. Um, so I think uh, Cody is going to help me with that. This is a, a local SE, Cody Diarkman. He's really good with VRA. So we're going we're gonna to start playing around with that. I think he actually originated the Home Lab series for V Brownbag as well. <laughs> so uh, if you want to go back and see where it all began, we'll get a link to that in the show notes too. Yeah, for sure. Um, another really cool dashboard, <clears throat> and this is a management pack called SDDC Health Dashboards. This is actually going to monitor all of your components to a software-defined data center. So like VROPS, uh, vCenter, NSX, vSAN. I think the only ones I'm missing are, let's see, SRN. Um, what, am I, what else am I forgetting? A couple other products that would be included in this. Maybe Network Insight. What am I forgetting? But anyway, pretty cool because it'll, it'll kind of Keep the health of your overall environment from a from a VMware perspective. Then, for your licensing, uh, are you using like a VMUG Advantage, or is it internal uh, VMware licensing? Or how yeah, it's all you? internal. Okay. Luckily, one of the perks of working at VMware, <clears throat> but the VMUG Advantage is awesome. So. Yeah, if I didn't have access to all that, I would definitely go with the VMUG Advantage. Yeah, the VMUG Advantage does have all of this licensing because that's what I use for my lab. Um, I'm a VMUG leader, so if you take my shilling of VMUG Advantage as a grain of salt, but uh, it it's really good. You've, they just added tons of new stuff too. So every component we've looked at is licensed in VMUG Advantage. Yeah, vSAN too, I think, right? Yep, vSAN, VRA, NSX, uh, Login Site, VROPS Enterprise, Horizon, everything is in there. Um, VRB is the other one I'm, I'm thinking of that's not here yet. I have it stood up, <clears throat> but I haven't configured it yet. So that's going to give me more of the, you know, the costing and the chargeback, showback, that sort of stuff. Yeah, a problem I've always had in my home lab is I set up all the components and I don't have enough capacity to monitor or manage anything. Yeah. So, so I actually get alerts, right, from, B, from BROPS. I'm getting emails. <laughs> you look here, you can see I've got some uh, notifications going out. So it's like a, it's like a full-blown environment, right? Uh, what else can we see? I'm pretty sure you have more horsepower than the first uh, VMware infrastructure I ever set up. <laughs> I think, yeah, the first one I ever set up is that's absolutely true. Um, the other thing I'll show you is within VROPS here, they have um, what's called an endpoint operations agent, which, if you're familiar with Hyperic back in the day, that's kind of this is taking over. 
for where Hyperic left off, right? So it's, it's an agent you deploy on Linux or Windows or that sort of thing. So I've deployed it on all of, or most of my systems here. So you can see here's the endpoint operations. These are all the agents that it's uh, sending data to VROPS, right? So if we go into environment, and then let's go to operating systems. Uh, you'll see those agents here. And if, if I had any Linux, I think I have a, a redhead in there, but I don't have an agent on it. Um, so these are all the, the operating systems at the guest level. And then within that, I'm monitoring other things like services and IIS, uh, SQL, all sorts of stuff. Even on my Flex server, I set up a custom monitor for Plex because it's just a, it's a, it's a process that's running, right? So if we look at it, I'll kind of show you what it looks like. So you just want to look for Flex Media Server, right? So you can do that with any process that's running on anything. And it, the cool thing is it gives you all the same kind of metrics, right? So you can see specifically this process is using this much CPU, this much memory, and you can set up alerts and all sorts of stuff based off of that. Uh, the SQL one's pretty cool too. And the SQL, uh, let me look here. I've got a couple other. Yeah, so Active Directory, IAS, and I thought I had SQL in here. Yeah, I need, I need to I'm grab that uh, Active Directory. Oh, one. there it is. SQL. Yeah, actually, let's, let's dig into that one. That one's pretty cool. So I use the endpoint agent to create my own like service monitors, but if there's one already built, I want to explore that too. Yeah, there is. Um, there's a good there's a blog out there. I forget who wrote it, but uh, all about alerting uh, around that. So here's the SQL one. You can see all the databases, right? And again, these have all the same really rich metrics that you can kind of Keep an eye on active transactions. What's my recovery model, right? It should be <clears throat> three, whatever, whatever three translates to. Uh, let's look at the, the AD one. Are there any, any questions out there? I mean, I'm just kind of poking around at this point. Uh, there's only one that we haven't really covered is have you or are you doing any nested labs or hosting in this or hosts in this? Yes, actually, good point. So um, this is a perfect example of how I'm showing back customer value, right? So I had a customer that's not using Update Manager and with all the Spectre meltdown craziness out there and having to patch uh, VM tools or upgrade it, and also upgrade the uh, the VM or, or the VM hardware. Uh, they wanted to start leveraging VOM, right? So, so I set up a little workshop here, and in my vSAN cluster, I've got these two nested ESXi hosts, and then down here, I've connected them to vCenter. So these hosts are actually these VMs right here, and and on that that little cluster, I've got a couple VMs, and if you look. So here's my red hat. It needs VMware tools and it needs, um, you know, the hardware version can be upgraded as well. So this is kind of a little playground where I kind of walk them through. You know, here's Update Manager and how you create baselines and how you remediate. So it's, it's flexible in that aspect too. Um, so yeah, I have. Good question. Um, I haven't done SRM yet. I'll probably do that at some point and be sure replication. I just need to find who, who I'm going to replicate to. And there's, there's other folks on the team that have home labs, so I may end up doing something like that, which would be kind of cool. I actually was able to do with the nested, uh, do a, rep, a very, very small replication in SRM between a nested one at one point. Oh, yeah, that, that might work. So if, yeah. if you really just needed to do a proof of concept, you could do that. But yeah, if you could find somebody else that would let you eat up the <laughs> bandwidth for some uh, visa replication, yeah. that'd be even better. Yeah. 
So we're getting a lot of good comments saying that it's uh, amazing and awesome and, and all those other things. So thank you very much <laughs> for uh, for running us through all this. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is like a hobby, so it's fun for me, right? Um, I'll show you this one other thing. So UNMS, uh, Ubiquity Network Management System. This is actually um, a really cool uh, product that they're building out, Ubiquity. And it actually runs in a Docker container. So I have, I spun up a, uh, a Ubuntu VM. And basically, well, here you can see all my public IPs and everything, but <laughs> uh, so I can manage like all of my Ubiquity network here directly from this one little management console, which is pretty sweet. So from my network or from my router, here's my interfaces. Uh, they're still working on building out, but I'll be able to manage the firewall, QoS. Uh, you can see my DHCP server, which is hanging off of this. Uh, and your routing, like OSPF, <clears throat> which I don't have any, any of that going on, but pretty cool. So there's a, there's a couple of good blogs out there on how to, how to build UNMS. Super easy. So, so a lot of fun. When are you going to put Vic and uh, VI, VMware integrated OpenStack in there? That's a question we just got. Um, at some point, I definitely want to start playing around with Vic. Um, OpenStack will probably do a nested lab, uh, like I did the VUM one. Uh, definitely want to do the Vic sooner than later, though. That, that stuff's really cool, and, and I need to get more exposure to that. So it's on the list for sure. Probably need more memory though first. So. I think it'll be about, well, at the price of memory these days, it'll probably be about $1,400. Yeah, memory so bumpies up. skyrocketed. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking at adding another Nook to my home lab, and it's about the same amount of memory. It's like doubled since I bought it the yeah. last time. That's awful. <laughs> well, yeah. what else can I show you? Um, here's the, the AD stuff from the, uh, the EPOPS agent, though. So a lot of good stuff here, LDAP specific. Not that I know a whole lot about AD or NTM or LDAP, but pretty cool stuff. Land binds for a minute. Yeah, pretty cool. A lot of good data in VROPS for sure. Yeah, uh, VROPS is probably my favorite application in the VMware suite. Yeah. What other dashboards are good? Oh, the, the endpoint operation for Java is actually really neat. So if I click on a, a VM here, like IS, you can see the object relationship, everything underneath it. And then it does a, kind of a scoreboard of all the uh, <clears throat> All the metrics. So here's my QDEP. Yeah. Oh, uh, Joey says that you help him with NSX and you can replicate to each other's home lab. Oh, there you go. That's another one. I have NSX in my lab. Um, but I haven't done much with it, and it's one of the things I really want to focus on. But you can see I've got my hosts prepped. This is a 6.4, by the way. So it's got some HTML5 in there. And, uh, you can do some trace flow stuff. So. Yep. Got to get to that, too. I don't have any firewall rules or distributed logical routers or anything like that yet. So and when you guys get that plan yet. when you get that set up you can co present and show an SRM fell over between your home labs. Oh, that'd be cool. We'll do a stretch player too maybe. I'm here to Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that is a good uh, geodiverse disaster recovery location. <laughs> I don't know, there's more earthquakes in Oklahoma than there are in California. <laughs> um 
one last thing about NSX 6.4 is there's a really cool upgrade section in here now. So once you upgrade your NSX manager to 6.4, um, I can't do it here because I've already done it, but you can uh, basically put up upgrade plan in place and it'll go out and push out everything and do it in the right order. It's really slick. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, what else? We have time for one more question or comment. Anybody? We have Graham saying a stretched layer two is evil. <laughs> so I don't necessarily want to end on that comment, but I wanted to make sure that it was. <laughs> um, he does have a good point of you can get memory for older servers if you're using a uh, an older generation of uh, platforms, the memory is a lot cheaper. Ah, that's a good point. The DDR um, form. The the really cool thing about these hosts is I've got ILO and I've got ITM ILO. So. <clears throat> yeah. So um, if. There's nothing else. I guess we can wrap it up. Do you have anything uh, that you'd like to promote or send us to? Um, if you want to check out my blog, it's just uh, tilkins.com. And then again, check out the, the wiredzone.com. Those guys are great. So that's about it. All right. Well, thank you very much. You have a lot of us in... Uh, in awe just how cool that all worked out and how much you're getting out of the hardware you've you've purchased. Yeah, definitely no regrets. So if you're if you're on the fence, I'd say go for it. All right. I'll uh make sure to give your email to my wife whenever she sees the credit card bill. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> all right. Well uh thanks for showing this. A lot of people are saying thanks. It's very nice. So, um, so we'll go ahead and call it here and thank you very much for, for showing this off. It's, it's a really, uh, good lab. You bet. Uh, have fun. So thank you. Have a good one. All right. You too.